Hi. I've um, got three cameras in front of you. I'm going to try and go through um, the notion of focus. And uh, starting off with the earliest camera available was a whole um, called a, an obscura, uh, which would allow light through and it would show up on a bathroom. Uh, which was if sufficiently dark uh, you could see the display through the pinhole show up on the far wall. This was refined uh, throughout history and um, it became quite a twee and uh, nice thing to go and uh, build yourself a camera obscura especially if you were landed gentry and there's one still today that I know of and have been at, right close to the um, River Avon by Brunel's Bridge uh, that crosses the Avon Gorge. And right there is a camera obscura built into a tower. Um, for combined entrance, you also get a, a little journey down a tunnel from that camera obscura into the, um, uh, I think it's called Cave of St. Nicholas, um, which is on the cliff face overlooking the gorge with good views over Bristol and uh, the length of the river. Uh, quite, quite an interesting day out just to look at the bridge, to look at the Camera Obscura Tower and obviously to walk along the, the tunnel passageway to the uh, the cliff face and then you, you're sort of saved by uh, metal railings a little bit like being up on the Empire State Building I should imagine but they were the first items just produce a hole shine something into a uh, an area which was dark whether it be a room or a behind a rock or something and the focus would sort itself out. Um, going later into the 60s, 70s and 80s, Agfa made a series of simple cartridge-based films. This one had a cassette in it. You slotted the cartridge cassette in, plastic affair, closed it, and then cocked it forward and then squeezed the shutter off fixed focus whatever came through that lens was uncontrollable um, by you the operator but would end up on the negative inside on the closed cassette or cartridge so <clears throat> these have been around for a few uh, hundreds of years now in some form or other whether it be camera obscura or whether it be neatly packaged into a a box and sold by one of the modern firms Kodak, Agfa or uh, Lomo in Russia. The second uh, type of focusing was really um, a little bit like one of these but with a, a movable lens this time with pictograms on and the first pictogram would be uh, one person second pictogram would be two or three people and the third normally the final pictogram would be uh, a square showing a hilly crag or peak or mountain uh, they alluded to portrait of a person close by a small group of people at a party and then the infinite would be that you wanted focus to extend all the way back um, to have as much as you could. And these pictograms uh, were in two types as well. Those that by setting them to the various pictograms, say the mountain, it would adjust uh, various settings within um, and the other basic type where it just altered the focus of the camera and didn't do anything about speed settings or aperture size um, it just basically moved your 
lend slightly to a position where focus would be more acceptable for the area you were choosing. So fixed focus and later pictogram types uh, where you could adjust the focus. Which leads us to this type of camera which is uh, meant to be a, a 35mm compact. It uses this type of film and its focus was by two things. <coughs> a coupled ring, couple, anything that coupled means it goes together with or it affects or it uh, connects to. So a coupled uh, range uh, setting here from infinitive, that's as far as you can see, to uh, nearby um, settings such as a meter, a meter point two or some in feet, sometimes uh, two and a half feet, three feet, etc. Um, and these um, were known generically as rangefinder cameras. And the rangefinder was done via this small window here, which you actually looked out of through this port here. So you would look through, you would adjust the setting of the range. Now this had numbers on. There were some rangefinders that didn't have numbers on. It was all done automatically by rotating the ring. And what would happen was uh, an effect would occur within the rangefinder view window. So this window here that looks out there would show you uh, if you were aiming um, at a small group of people for instance then you'd look for a sharp edge on them or the house next to them or behind them or a rain pipe that's going down from the guttering and if it was incorrectly uh, focused the, the rain pipe would be like that and you'd be trying to adjust that dial here so that you've got the image inside your viewfinder to come across like this from there to this by turning the dial. So there's no real need to have numbers on, some didn't, but in the event of the 50s, the 60s and the 70s with uh, more money, more funds being diverted from military projects back onto peacetime projects, uh, there was a, an ability to sell goods to individuals rather than um, make it for the government. Um, all these items got added in, were affordable, and people paid for more. So this was then what was generically known as a rangefinder. It was coupled. What does that mean? Well, whatever you did with that produced an action within this small area here. Now, it had to be done like that, and the reason it had to be done like that was because of the parallax uh, factor which is the fact that if you are looking through a viewfinder that's a side to the side of where the lens is then you're going to have uh, two different star points the film plane which is running along here wants to receive um, the vista, the picture, uh, which is going to come through that lens there. But you are actually trying to focus and direct what the picture taken is through this small here. So you can see straight away that you have almost um, two inches gap between the two. And if you imagine how a child would draw a, ra a railway line he would draw nearest to him two lines about this distance and then away from him they would merge, almost touch. And that to him was how a railway line looked. Well that is exactly what parallax is. The further you're away the less of a problem it is because they're nearly coinciding the two lines. The view from one and the view from the picture taking lens. The nearest, so when you're talking about group pictures um, 
and portraits, it was critical because you had a gap now which could be almost, um, you know, make the result such an unfocused mess that uh, you, you might have to go and do the assignment again, which wouldn't be good. So the rangefinder brought this complex of adjusting what the lens focus was via the viewfinder, uh, which worked on this parallax system. And how it got it focused was by literally overlapping one of the railway lines onto the other through that lens there. That would then mean you were sharp for the area of focus you desired, which might be that group of people in the middle, you know, five to six meters away, or it might be something a little bit closer or further. Not too much of a problem if you had it on infinitive. The infinitive sign is like a, a double O or an eight, um, and that would normally give you focus over a wider range, but might blur the range very close to you. So if you were looking at taking a picture of um, the mountains behind, but with Percy the dog running around in the garden, then you might miss Percy because you've got the setting wrong. So you'd have to do an indeterminate uh, uh, fix between uh, the dog, where the dog's position was and where the mountains are, and hope that you caught focus on both the mountain and the um, and the dog, the pet. You could do that with cameras that had various settings in that adjusted the aperture size or the shutter size and speed. Um, some even allowed you to adjust the film speed. So although you were putting a 400 ASA in, you could up it to 800 or by adjusting a ring with the ISA or the ASA depending what standard you want to use. They're both the same. One's American and one's international. And they both mean the speed of that film, whereas the shutter means the speed that this camera is going to work and the aperture, the size of what this camera is going to use. So you have three settings, the film speed, the aperture, and the guillotine shutter going across at what speed. And all those three things could help you pull in focus or push out focus a little bit, as well as allow more lighting, uh, which allows you uh, to have faster shutter and catch things uh, that otherwise would have become blurry because of movement. So the rangefinder, and that's still in existence today, still being made in some places, but the obvious shortfall of that was that you always had the parallax compensation to perform. You either had to do it in the camera or be aware of it so that you adjusted your focus between, like I was saying with the animal and the mountains. So you would always have to work hard to get uh, over the parallax, that's the two different points, trying to look at the same thing and not always getting there. This next camera um, is a Miranda and it's got a, a prism on it which has a view binder port for you to put your eye up against and it can also be used as a stand up and look down. So this would be similar to a twin lens reflex. Um, the only difference is you are looking through the same lens that will take the picture. And that was the beauty of SLRs um, and digital SLRs, is that what you looked at here, either through this way, the old fashioned twin lens reflex, um, there's a Minolta that Pete Sullivan has put on, or by putting the uh, prism on and then looking through and that will go through and bounce up and down through the prism through onto a mirror and out through there 
telling you what the film plane will eventually see when the mirror goes up to, to free the film plane. And this was the eureka really of photography because all the pros, semi-pros and uh, hobbyists uh, decided this was a compact system. You could change lenses fairly easily. Uh, you only needed the one lens to change, whereas on the twin lens reflex, if you wanted to go through that, you might have to add um, extra uh, lenses on the on the viewing one as well as the picture taking lens. Um, so this sewed it up. Uh, it took the same film as the early range finders, which were these uh, 35 mil. How did we get to 35 mil? Well, from the bulky film and the glass plates that we originally had, um, the Germans, of all people, decided they'd had enough. They were going to use uh, film from the movie cameras. So both sides of the Atlantic, um, they decided to cut up stocks of this um, very cheap 35 mil film that was made in abundance and put it into small cassettes that looked like this really from the word go maybe a little bit more cruder than these which have their own advertising on now but they were basically the same an airtight or light tight should I say uh, canister whether it be made out of uh, pressed or stamped steel or tin or aluminium casing um, it could take up to sometimes 50 of these, but they, they t t tended to favour sizes in 36 exposures, 12 exposures, and then 24 exposures. Uh, so these items basically allowed more scope in the rangefinder camera, more scope with the emerging SLRs from the 50s, 60s and um, great, great things. So the actual focusing that you have on uh, an SLR is still done with twisting or rotating um, uh, the lens uh, to pull one series of lenses nearer or farther away from the first set of lenses and it can be done by looking at uh, the numbers just like the rangefinder or it can be done uh, by looking through uh, the screen and just like you had on the rangefinder now that viewfinder that has the moving system inside now is incorporated in most modern SLRs and DSLRs in the one lens and the one uh, optical viewport at the back. Uh, you have autofocus now which is obviously uh, mechanically and electronically decided but they all work on the same principle as a coupled meter. Whatever is done on the lens will affect what is seen in the viewport. So I hope you like the three cameras I've brought out. Miranda with its movable um, prism which could have um, a normal uh, sports um, housing on and when you use it that way you tend to find that um, if you take the and look down things are on the wrong side of the screen when you've done that because the prism has what as one of its um, actions is to write the picture the way the film plane will see it and not the way the mirrors show you uh, but when you take the prism off and just look at that through there from above and this is a great facility when you've got it on a tripod and you'll say waiting for some birds and things like that to come into a uh, an aerial scene of, of the back, backdrop of mountains behind the house. You, you're not got your eye up to a, a prism waiting and waiting and waiting. You can just generally see, and when in the aid of something like this, 
Oh, quite easy. Got it now. Press and away you go. This is a delay switch. It can be held on B, which is bulb, forever open until you release, or on any of the speed settings that uh, are shown on the top speed dial. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed that. Focus. Thank you.